Okay, while our attendees continue to come in, I think we can make a start. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the sixth and last of our webinars. And these have been the main part of a British Academy funded project on ethics and ethics committees during the pandemic, which uh, I have co-organized with my colleague, Emma Cave, who will now wave to you. Um, thank you, Emma. This one is about the underlying ethical and legal principles that have been used by such committees during the pandemic. The uh, webinars are recorded um, and we hope to uh, edit and upload them to the dedicated project website that you can find on Emma's Durham University webpage and find the link there. Um, the format I hope will be fairly familiar to those of you who have attended before. We have a number of speakers, each of whom will address the topic uh, for up to 10 minutes. And that will be followed by a Q&A session from other members of uh, the panel. But also I will try to facilitate questions from um, the audience. Um, you will be able to post any questions as attendees on the Q&A function. Uh, one slight difference which Emma will explain is that this is going to be a game of two halves. We're going to let the Europeans go first for a change and then we'll go to the uh, UK speakers and uh, just our gratitude to both of those for attending in particular uh, to Gree who's attended at very short notice given one of our previous speakers had to uh, back out. I will then make some comments at the end with due thanks uh, for, uh, for wrapping up the six webinars but for now uh, I'm going to hand over to Emma, who will chair and introduce the speakers. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. And again, welcome to, to everybody. Uh, so today we're going to hear from our first two speakers, and then we're going to pause for some questions, as, as Dave has said. We'll start off with some questions from our panellists, and then, and then we'll turn to uh, questions from attendees. So please do use the Q&A function. Write your questions in there and, and make clear, if you can, please, who the question's for, whether it's for the first speaker or the second speaker. OK, and then um, after that, we'll then go on to our, our, the second half with another three speakers, uh, one of which is a double act. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome our first speaker, who is Professor Dr. Elena Burks. Elena is chair of the German Ethics Council and a distinguished medical ethicist. We're very lucky to hear from Elena in our first webinar um, and are delighted to welcome you back again, Elena, to give us an international perspective on some of the guiding principles. So I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dave and Emma, for the introduction um, and for the uh, second invitation. That means it could have been completely horrible uh, last time. So that's very encouraging. Um, it's good to see everybody. Um, I will share um, just a few quick um, thoughts about the principles that the German Ethics Council discussed when developing um, the priority setting for vaccination, um, because I thought it's helpful, first of all, to have an, a concrete example, and secondly, because GRI will also be talking about that, so um, we'll make it a nice, tight session that way. That said, um, we issued a number of other reports and opinions um, on the pandemic, and um, there are other principles at play there, uh, so um, I'll very happily um, talk about some of those if we if we have time um, later in the discussion. Uh, but for now, I'm going to just uh, start very briefly by explaining um, how um, priority setting was developed um, in Germany. It was very clear, although I think if I may say this here, not as clear as it is now, <laughs> not as clear possibly to the, EU, to the EU as it might have been to other global players that there would be initial scarcity of vaccines, which of course means that it is necessary to set some sort of priorities. Um, and because vaccines um, or the allocation of, of vaccines touches upon absolutely fundamental goods of life and health, uh, protection of, of life and health. Um, it was also clear that this could not just be done based on medical or indeed epidemiological principles, but also had to take into account ethical, legal principles. 
Um, and so the Secretary of Health uh, in Germany asked not just one committee, but actually three committees uh, to develop something, to develop a framework for the subsequent uh, priority setting lists and, and approach. Um, and that was um, the German Ethics Council, um, and it was the um, National Academy of Sciences, and it was our standing committee on vaccination, which we've had for a couple of decades. And the three of us, that has never happened, but we've, we've formed a, everybody who, who, anybody who works uh, in committees knows that that's um, not necessarily always the easiest way to get stuff done, but um, it worked surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. Um, the three of us uh, formed a joint working group and um, got on it um, and developed um, this framework for priority setting, which, while it hasn't remained entirely uncontested, of course, um, has been largely followed a little too strictly, um, if you ask me, with um, a certain German flair for bureaucracy that is not entirely helpful and possibly also not um, helpful from an ethical perspective, um, but it is being followed more or less, and it also has great support in the population still. Before I tell you the principles, I must make the note that we developed this in October and published it in early November. By that time, we did not know anything about transmission. We could not, because the studies were not set up that way, we could not anticipate, we didn't, in fact, we hoped. I mean, as a medic, I was sort of convinced that was going to happen, but just from some vague understanding of the medical principles of vaccines, but still we could not anticipate and could not um, take that as a given that vaccinated people would no longer transmit. Now, as we know, the data from the UK and from Israel looks fantastic, uh, regarding that aspect. It's not, not really set in stone yet, but we're, we're getting there. That's, that's very, very encouraging. But um, I'm mentioning this because it might have changed our priorities a little bit. Um, although, again, I also must say the initial priority setting would not have looked different because we went uh, very much for the following uh, principles. Um, the starting point, um, obviously, self-determination and autonomy. So this was just the starting point to, to, to say that there was not going to be mandatory vaccination because this was something uh, where uh, people's rights over their own bodies were to be respected, in particular against the background that the risk is so heterogeneously um, um, stratified across the entire population. Um, the second um, important principle um, was non-maleficence and the protection of, of integrity. And this really is where the rubber hits the road. So we, we, we were in wide agreement um, that we would have to protect those at the greatest risk of harm, which was severe causes of COVID and death. Um, and not uh, the protection of harm towards the entire population. That's why I mentioned the fact that we didn't know about transmission. But even if we had known, we would have understood harms mm -hmm. first in terms of individual risks of um, severe causes and deaths. Of course, those accumulate and do have a population impact. And only secondly, we would have considered um, the epidemiological um, um, understanding of harms in this respect. We mentioned that um, beneficence did not play a big role. So that was just uh, to inform everybody that sort of the usual understanding of medicine to offer the best possible treatment to people, to individuals would have to step back here and we would have to widen the, the thought and the, the perspective towards um, a population health orientation. Um, then we considered um, the principle of justice and equality before the law, equality before the law to simply um, rule out certain discriminatory um, goals of an allocation um, or principles that would not be um, in line with the quality of the law by social status or something like that. So we had to had to rule out these kinds of um, potentially discriminating principles, which is quite important because um, probably um, that meant that some very vulnerable groups um, are very high on our priority list that might 
fall down if, for example, overall length of life or stuff like quality of life um, or even um, sort of uh, capabilities in terms of um, not not the capability approach, sorry, if uh, um, impaired capacities uh, would have been uh, considered. Um, so that was quite an important um, thing to just um, make clear. Um, and Justice, of course, mentioned that you can treat different people differently, which means that um, the very basic uh, understanding of justice that uh, if somebody has a different um, risk situation, then it is acceptable uh, from a position of justice to treat them differently and give them priority. Um, and the final two were solidarity. Solidarity didn't do very much analytically speaking, but we used it as an overall framing principle, if you will. We said the entire thing, the entire um, effort of giving priority to those at the highest um, danger of getting seriously harmed is an exercise in solidarity by everybody else stepping back and by everybody else ruling in their self-interest in favor of these groups. Um, and then the final um, principle was urgency that we also had to consider um, whose risks were most urgent, where did we have to intervene first, where would harms occur um, the quickest. Um, and so all of us, and this is um, not surprising, led us to say um, that priority groups would be people with the highest risk for severe disease and death. Um, and actually looking at risk groups there, very clearly it was the very elderly in care homes, like a thousand times higher risks um, of severe causes and deaths, healthcare workers at risk and essential workers um, at risk. Um, and we defined the goals of, of um, vaccination and we handed over this very broad framework to the standing committee uh, for vaccination that then looked at the evidence that was available at that time and developed the first of the priority setting lists. We now are at version four, I think. The legal um, regulation that was written, the legal order that was written is also, I think, in its third version and the fourth is being prepared. So this is being updated. We, we also said these have to be living documents. It's not something that we can now set in stone. Um, and we're trying as ethicists our best to rein in a certain, um, again, I said a certain overreach in terms of how this is implemented because as I just presented it to you, that was rather broad with the wish to under, to put some evidence behind it. Um, but in very typical German fashion, it has led to attention to minuscule differences in practice um, and a certain rigidity in applying this. So um, just to give you um, in the last 20 seconds um, an idea of how it's now going to go, um, the framework um, that still is still going to underline a priority setting in practice um, but we will ease this to some degree when it goes into GP practices. We didn't have enough vaccine uh, doses to go into GP practices so far. So we had to do it in the vaccination centers and um, with the mobile teams going to care homes and, and so on. And so once it's rolled out into uh, doctor's offices, it will doctors will have the freedom to be a little more flexible and to determine which of my patients fall into which group. Um, and we've just said, look, we trust you. We have to trust you um, to do it, broadly speaking, according this um, priorities, um, but not, we will not um, require elaborate um, bureaucratic ways of, of um, reporting on this just to get things out as quickly as possible. And I think I'll leave it there and um, I'll be very happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. That was that was fascinating. We're going to move straight on now to Bree's presentation. Uh, but just a reminder, we've got one question so far. Please do put your questions in the Q&A um, and, and after this next presentation, uh, we'll be able to turn to those. Um, so tying in extremely well with uh, Elena's paper, our next, speak, our next speaker is Dr. Gree Wester from King's College London. And Gree is a specialist in political philosophy and global health ethics, and is going to speak to her experiences as a member of the Norwegian vaccination priority group. So 
welcome and thank you very much for coming and uh, I know you're going to share some slides aren't you so please go ahead yeah thank you very much for having me it's a, it's a pleasure to be here so yeah thank you for the uh, invitation okay let me just start my my slides first of all yeah so it's great uh, it was it's great to hear Elena's presentation and, and mine follows on very nicely after that um and actually was well, an anecdotal bit we had a, a German who was a chair of our committee actually but he, yeah he's, he has a Norwegian wife and he's moved to Norway and he was leading our our efforts um as so I know he's been communicating a lot with, with various people in Germany about our recommendations and our um and our process um but anyway yes so yeah so I was in last September Last year, in September last year, I was invited to join an expert ethics group organized by uh, the Norwegian Public Health Institute. And our task was to give advice to the Norwegian government about the planned coronavirus immunization program. Um, so, and the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, they set up this ethics group um, because they had been commissioned by the Norwegian Ministry of Health and Care Services to organize the national uh, coronavirus immunization program. So our ethics, uh, ethics advisory group was just one piece in the whole big uh, jigsaw of, of different moving moving pieces sort of contributing to the overall organization of the vaccination program. Um, it was extremely interesting work to be doing and, and a lot of interesting lessons to be learned as well in doing sort of policy work in, in writing as an ethicist, you know, formulating recommendations that you know are actually going to pretty immediately impact on how things have been uh, running. There are lots of interesting differences in how you, you'd write maybe a theoretical journal article and, 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 and writing this kind of uh, report. Um, I'm going to say just a little bit about uh, our process in putting together our recommendations. And I'll also tell you what our key recommendations were. And I'll try to speak a little bit about uh, also the role of values in, in the work that, that, we, that we did. And now, yeah, like I said, I think this will follow on nicely from what Elena was saying. There's a fair bit of overlap, but also um, some differences. So, so I think that'd be interesting to, to look at. So um, we had a very clearly specified mandate for our work. Like I said, we were not the only, uh, the only group here contributing to the organization of the vaccination program. So specifically, we were tasked to establish what the goals should be of the vaccination program. And secondly, to decide which groups should be given priority in the first phase of the vaccination program. And just as Elena was commenting on, I mean, when we did this work, I mean, we were working between September and November, and we knew much less about the vaccines back then. So there are a lot of empirical uncertainties at the time, um, but that's just how it is. You have to formulate the recommendations anyway on the basis of what is known. Um, so, I mean, we had to, of course, say that our recommendations were preliminary, that they might change uh, in accordance with new knowledge coming to light and so on. But you just try and sort of do the best that you can with the evidence that is available. But yeah, the question of the extent to which vaccines reduce transmission is, of course, extremely central, but so little was known about that back then. We also had, uh, it was a very quick turnaround in this work. Um, so I think normally as an ethicist, you like to sort of delve into different arguments and, and justifications and, and look at different uh, uh, potential counterfactuals and so on. But we, in, in our report, we have to simply uh, communicate our, um, our conclusions and not go into so much uh, our arguments for the, for the different uh, conclusions. And we had to just also prioritize going for clear recommendations and, and not look so much into different possible alternative cases. So yeah, there's a lot of sort of limits to what we can do and to how much detail we can work out to recommendations given that we had so little time. And again, you know, it's important to have these recommendations ready when we thought the vaccines might arrive in December already. So yeah, some, some nuances uh, um, it gets lost in, in this kind of work when you have to do it so quickly. Uh, and yeah, like we, our report is a little bit short on, on arguments and justifications. And this is something we as an ethics group would like to address, you know, post the publication of our recommendations. We wanted to pursue, uh, look at our own work a bit critically in, in hindsight to develop some points a bit further. 
but overall we um we are satisfied with the work that we did we think we did a good job uh, and the recommendations have been overall followed by the um, Norwegian Public Health Institute and by the Norwegian government so um, this was the process that we set out um, that we wanted to identify and define first a guiding values framework, which then um, was to, um, to guide the definition of the goals of the vaccination programs, program and then in turn to, to define the priority groups. Now, post the publication of our recommendations, we have discussed the fact that this is a very sort of top down process. So start with your values and principles and then uh, develop recommendations on that basis. But we have discussed whether maybe it could have been equally valid to start from the bottom and up, consider different groups and scenarios and discuss arguments for and against different types of prioritization and so on. I mean, we did reflect on the fact that given that, yeah, well, this is partly also due to the quick turnaround, but given that we started with the sort of values and principles, uh, our recommendations are perhaps a bit broad and coarse grain that we've kind of in a way left out more specific types of cases. Uh, for example, the question of vaccinating those with very short expected life and poor quality of life. I mean, we didn't think about that case specifically when we worked in the sort of uh, way that we did, uh, but, but perhaps there are sort of spe special types of cases that would have been more easily caught if we had done a different kind of process sort of starting from the bottom and up. So I think this is an interesting sort of methodological question to consider for this kind of work. Uh, although that being said, I think, yeah, again, coming back to the question of the very quick turnaround, I think perhaps the sort of this process that we followed might be the more efficient one, even if it has perhaps some um, limitations. So these were the core values, and we could also call the principles that we uh, came up with. I noticed it was interesting to hear Elena talk about, you've selected some different values and principles uh, in, in the German work. Although I think in the end, the sort of underlying ethos is very similar, even if we called things by different names and chose a different set of principles. Um, I'm not going to say anything more specific about each of these different values, um, but I do want to say a little bit, you know, why did we want to have a values framework? And here we were leaning a bit on the WHO uh, they released a paper sort of precisely to support this kind of ethics committee work. Um, they were saying, they were arguing it's important to have a values framework in sort of explicit recognition that the vaccine allocation can't be driven by scientific considerations alone. Um, so in deciding who should get the vaccine first, of course, some interests are put before others. So this is exactly an ethical question and a question of distributive justice, which also Eliana was uh, commenting on. But it's an, another interesting aspect that I wanted to say a little bit about was that these values are also underdeterminate. So we can't, I mean, they sound very nice and sort of aspirational here, but we can't really directly derive our priority groups from them or the goals from the vaccination program. So I would say these values are more of a, a platform or a fundament from which we build or develop the vaccine program's goals and priority orders. And perhaps you could say they function to some extent like constraints, so they rule out certain outcomes. Uh, all goals and priority groups that we define must be consistent with these values, but that leaves a lot more room, I think, uh, for discussion about who should be um, prioritized. Um, and so I think one of the sort of discussions I've had uh, post-publication post of our recommendation is that how tightly linked are really our values and our recommendations. Uh, you know, how much can you sort of uh, diverge from these values? And, and I think this is a question I haven't really got a good answer to at this point. Um, but one, one more specific question here is about whether we really gave enough weight to equity, for example. Um, I mean, you can, you can ask, you know, when you look see our recommendations, in a moment, you know, how does really equity come to play out in those recommendations? And would it have been possible to come up with different recommendations that actually gave more white weight to equity and, for example, reducing harm to, to groups, uh, to socially disadvantaged groups, for example? So these are some kind of, I mean, I'm putting this out there as kind of questions and also in the spirit of, of critical scrutiny of our own uh, work and, and questions that I think are, are interesting to think about.
also going to just briefly I mentioned you might have already recognized this from the list that we did not include reciprocity. Um, we did actually discuss solidarity briefly, and we didn't include that either. But yeah, so um, just briefly, you know, why did we not include reciprocity? It has been adopted as a core value in other vaccine allocation proposals. Um, we decided against this value because, I mean, there are some problematic aspects of reciprocity, we believe. So for example, you can ask questions around who makes valuable contributions and how do we decide that? Uh, is it only healthcare workers or other frontline workers who should be sort of uh, prioritized um, on the basis of reciprocity? And is there perhaps a risk that we have a certain bias towards certain high status professions? Um, and then there's another type of argument against reciprocity familiar from disability scholarship. Um, when we talk about contributions that should be recognized and rewarded, uh, we're often implicitly perhaps thinking about labor labor contributions. So people who cannot work, for example, um, are they then being uh, discriminated against in terms of that they are not being, they cannot be recognized for sort of reciprocity of their contributions of labor because they're not, not contributing by labor. And, and is it only those who are making contributions to society in this very specific way who sort of deserving of, of protection? So these were some reasons why, why we are of course, we, we recognize this reasonable disagreement on this, and there's a lot to be said for reciprocity also, but we felt in the end we decided not to include it um, as a value. Okay, I think I don't, we don't have so much, uh, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna, yeah, quickly say these were the goals that we defined. Uh, and I'm only gonna say one thing about it. You might think that you know, why did we really need to define the goals of the vaccination program? Is that not really obvious what the goals should be? But actually it's, it's not obvious because it's not obvious that we as a society must always give so high priority to saving lives. So we don't always do that or, or necessarily do that. We don't always save lives at any cost. So that is a question that is a valid question to think about, you know, what should be the order of these different, uh, different goals of the program? Um, and in the end, we did give, um, I mean, our idea was that you should pursue these goals simultaneously if you can. However, if they come into conflict with each other, then you start, you, you pursue the sort of higher ranked goals first. But yes, as you can see, we did, gave, we did give high priority to reducing illness and death. And some economists criticized us, they felt we should have given more weight to the sort of lower ranked goals about for example, thinking more about the economy. Lastly, just to sort of at least give you a glimpse of the recommendations that we ended up with. I mean, they're very similar to the recommendations that Elena uh, described in much more detail. Uh, so we ended up giving high, highest priority to risk groups and where risk groups is defined by, uh, by medical sort of risks that sort of medical risks. So that would be either medical conditions uh, or age by itself. Um, and then, as you can see, healthcare workers coming lower down our, our priority order. Uh, so this is perhaps the most controversial aspect of our uh, of our recommendations. And I mean, the, as you can see, so this is the idea of dynamic prioritization: is that the priority order changes if uh, infection rates go up dramatically. Um, and of course, this has exactly implications for um, the, the prioritization of healthcare workers. So I mean, there are two main arguments for prioritizing healthcare workers. And one is we want healthcare workers to be healthy so that can keep the healthcare system going. Of course, so that, that, that has implications for also population health, of course. Um, however, if there's no real risk of, of the healthcare system sort of uh, being overwhelmed, then um, that is when we give lower priority to healthcare workers. And for a long time, that was the situation in Norway. Our infection rates were fairly low, so there was no need to, to give high priority to healthcare workers. But when infection rates go up, then healthcare workers go up the sort of priority list. Um, the second argument for prioritizing healthcare workers, I mean, less central overall, but that is the reciprocity argument. And in the end, we decided not to include uh, reciprocity as a, as a value. So I think, um, I think I'll stop there. Um, yes, thank you very much.
Fabulous. Thank you very much, Gree. That was that was really, really good. And thanks also to Elena. They just fitted in really well. And it was so good to bring a focus on vaccination policy into the series. We, we haven't really talked about that to date. Um, so what we're going to do now is, first of all, turn to the other panellists to see if you have any questions. Um, meanwhile, people are busy writing and there'll be a few questions from the from the attendees uh, after that. So does anybody have anything to say? Perhaps, um, Elena, do you want to say anything in response to Gree's presentation? Um, yes, if I may, just two quick things. I jumped over the goals that we also defined. <laughs> so uh, strictly for time reasons, um, to be honest, because I was asked to speak mostly about the uh, principles, um, could have uh, called them values, by the way. So we had a long discussion of what to call them. Actually, <laughs> but, yes, I mean, yeah. that, that is. <laughs> you know, every ethicist knows that one. Um, but I would, if I may, just um, 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 throw into the discussion the goals that the German Ethics Council defined because they're very, very close to what the Norwegians did. Um, we did also um, have as a first one the prevention of severe causes of uh, COVID-19, hospitalization and deaths. The second, the protection of persons with an especially high work-related risk of exposure so-called occupational indication, which is what gave us the opportunity to actually include in the very first group already healthcare workers, not just the risk groups, but also healthcare workers at the highest um, danger of um, getting uh, an infection. Um, third, prevention of transmission and protection in environments with many vulnerable individuals and in those with a high outbreak potential. We were thinking of um, workers in um, sort of precarious work situations. We had many outbreaks there or asylum seekers. Um, but we did say that the transmission, the prevention of transmission, we couldn't sort of aim for. So it was more about the protection of people in these circumstances. And then fourth, maintenance of essential state functions and public life, which is your fourth and fifth uh, sort of thrown together. So very, very similar, which I think is interesting. I do believe that we, we, we have very, very similar values or principles. We just call them something different. Yes, um, so we put a lot more under justice that you put elsewhere. And I think, um, but that's very familiar territory to anybody in, in uh, uh, philosophical ethics or um, actually any form of, of, of ethics um, to sort of know that you can conceptualize things differently. And I think, um, more or less, there is a lot of similarity um, there. The second point I just want to very briefly make, um, which I remember discussing with a member of your um, committee, ah. Hensley, is the one about um, the situation, the pandemic situation and how much it is under control and whether that would... Um, we did not include that because we said that is sort of moving away from the risk and harm emphasis that we actually have in ours. Um, it's not exclusively focusing on harm, of course, I did show that, but um, we also didn't have the reciprocity idea in there. Um, and we said, actually, no matter how um, terrible it is, we need to make sure first are the ones who are most vulnerable and the ones looking after these. So to us, the, that was one group. So we, we, we had some health, because we had some healthcare workers there, we said that's covered. So the way it was, it was developed was if total catastrophe happened very quickly, total over being overwhelmed, that priority would still address um, the areas where um, it would be most necessary, um, even in the biggest crisis. We did not ever consider that in such a situation we would take the risk groups out and give it just to healthcare workers, for example. I know some have discussed that or then um, prioritize essential workers higher because we also knew that the really essential workers like police um, in, a, in a super, super crisis, I mean, I'm talking... Yeah. The, I know that you were you were considering those kinds of scenarios, so that's why I'm why I'm saying that. Um, in in such a situation, those essential workers most most of them would would have been fairly young, 
and we said, look, they they still don't have the highest risks, and they'll sort of be they, they will be fine. We still must protect those who are at the biggest risk of severe cases and death because they will continuously overwhelm the healthcare system. If we want to get any handle on a really, really horrifying crisis, we must focus on that. Um, but I think that's a very, very interesting question, how, how people dealt with, with this kind of um, question, sort of the, the trade-off between the risk groups and the, the essential workers, um, the different types of essential workers. So thank you very much. That was really illuminating. Thank you. Just one tiny point to just add to that. Um, that in, I mean, I should add that in Norway, no healthcare workers have died. So if you go by, so this is why it sort of follows from this list, you know, there wasn't, we, healthcare workers were not deemed to be at high risk of death in Norway. But this, of course, in other countries, that's not the case. In the UK, lots of healthcare workers have died and that changes where they sort of come in. So anyway, yeah, that was, that was all I was going to say about that. Okay, does anybody else have a burning question from our panel or can we turn to the attendees? Okay, Dave, have you, have you had a look at the, at the questions from the attendees? I have been looking at the chat room, so I think there's uh, a couple of questions I want to pick out. One is the, um, the question of identifying at-risk groups. I take it that, that that has been predominantly done in terms of age um, or profession, but there has been a debate, obviously, about the extent to which certain groups um, I think minority groups, as well as those from deprived areas, uh, are at greater risk simply because of background health deterrence. And I wonder if you, uh, both of you, would like to comment on that as to whether that should enter into our, our prioritization um, system. I, the other question which you might uh, want to both answer is what defines a key worker? Uh, <laughs> which is a huge one. And I heard uh, Gris worry that one reason they were not going to include reciprocity was precisely the difficulty of being clear about the boundaries of the concept, but it's there in the Deutsche Ethikrat advice. And Chris, there was some debate in the UK about whether you included supermarket workers or even Amazon delivery drivers as being as a much risk of other, uh, and also key workers. So do you want to take those two questions? Um, that's probably fairly briefly, how far do we take account of social determinants of health in identifying at-risk groups? And secondly, what are the boundaries of key workers? You want me to start? Go on. Okay, um, thanks very much. Very, very good questions. Uh, we did take into account um, social determinants to some degree. So we uh, looked specifically at groups. Um, since we, since we look, looked at the the, the numbers we had, or actually that was done by the standing uh, vaccination committee. So they looked at the empirical stuff. That was no longer the ethics council, I should say that. Um, but they considered the available evidence and they found that um, people in asylum, um, so uh, um, some very vulnerable groups, such as um, the homeless, um, sorry, um, such as um, people living in um, 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 uh, asylum seekers um, quarters, um, precarious workers um, had had very, very high numbers of being affected and consequently also quite many um, severe um, causes and deaths. So those were included. We did not um, and I think the situation is, is a little different um, to the UK. We didn't see, at least initially, that we had, we, and uh, I should say another such factor is obesity. That was also included very early on. But we did not look at, for example, ethnicity. We don't do the uh, BAME uh, sort of um, stratification of the data in Germany that way. So initially that data, was, it wasn't available. We didn't know whether there were certain social groups, for example, defined by ethnicity or defined by, um, I don't know, uh, the, the level of income or something that were most affected. We actually reduced it down to the, if you will, um, either physiological factors or structural factors in terms of where they lived that had something to do with contact, with close contact. So that's why 
to some degree, we did put social determinants of health in there if they impinged clearly on directly relevant levels of harm or levels of risk of harm. But we didn't do something like compensating certain groups um, for being worse off from the start. That we didn't do, um, partly because it's not um, possible it wasn't possible based on the data. The data was not available as that related to COVID, only indirectly, again, via obesity. And you do know obesity is, is sort of is stratified on a socioeconomic gradient. So it sort of snuck in there, but not um, as an independent factor. And actually now uh, we do see that we also have these differences in Germany, not not likely not as pronounced as in the US and in the UK from what I've seen from the data, but we do have them and we're um, looking into that data, but I doubt actually that it will impact on the priority setting because we're in sort of, we're, we've progressed through a lot of the priority setting and are really trying to get over this as, as quickly as possible. I should also say it's not a priority setting that sort of intended to prioritize the entire population. Our idea was the groups most affected and then we'll open it up very quickly. Um, so um, that's sort of, that's probably one that we might have done had we intended to do priority setting sort of until the last person gets, gets a jab. Um, and the second one, um, how do you define key workers? Well, we did define them to some degree again by risk so we looked at defined, not we, standing committee, looked at the data that they had on um, outbreaks and deaths and, and, and uh, infections and uh, severe causes in various groups um, of workers. Um, quite across the board, we, did ha we had a, a list of essential workers defined before in the first lockdown who had... Um, access to, um, how do you say this, um, emergency services for childcare. Highly contested list, of course, and to this day, highly contested. But it sort of gave us, a, gave the standing committee a certain starting point, and then they checked which of these groups have higher or elevated risks. And indeed, we found that supermarket workers do have elevated risks, not that much, but a lot more than sort of uh, the rest of the population. So we put them in towards, uh, they were put in towards the, quite towards the end, but they were put in. Um, and as you might have, um, might have, you probably don't know this, but one of the things that was changed was that teachers and um, child care workers were elevated within the priorities. And to my mind, that violated the principles that we had established that was a, either a reciprocity um, motivated move or a political move to make them safe while you sent them into schools that were not protected in a different way. So I said publicly in the media that I really wish they'd had used alternative means such as testing regimes before changing the priorities that we had sort of established and that were overall, I hope, justified quite reasonably well um, before they just changed that to make it happen that schools could be opened. Um, but I will say the more it sort of gets away from this initial framework and towards practice and the more fine-grained it got, the more other things snuck in there a little. So there is a little reciprocity there, of course, and there is a little judgment of what we think is essential. So in the legal document, police was a lot higher. Those police that are actually, you know, doing the demonstrations, obviously not, not everybody, the police, but the groups that are out there um, with anti-corona um, demonstrations, but still the, the risks probably wouldn't have put them there. But that was a political decision uh, when the, the actual regulation was written. So it was diluted to some degree and some other values and principles snuck in there. The broad ideas are still more or less there, but that's just what, you know, theory and practice, if you will. Great. Thanks, Elena. I think, Gree, that 
you want to take just the question about social determinants of health and those um, those from socially deprived areas and ethnic minority group members? Yes, I'll just uh, speak quickly to that. So just to say again, when we um, when we looked at yeah, so you know what criteria defines the risk group? So in the first instance, the sort of highest risk factors that we identified, which is the same as, as everywhere else, which is is age. Uh, sorry, age and then underlying diseases. So these are both factors that are directly sort of medically relevant risk factors. Uh, but also, as Elena said, we, you know, when it comes to, you know, what are these medical conditions, that's where we sort of hand over to the epidemiologists and that kind of evidence is also something that sort of keeps getting updated. However, we also considered, I mean, so this is, is, is what the question was about, was, that, well, what about socioeconomic disadvantage as a risk factor? Um, and it's been very interesting to be working on, you know, the Norwegian uh, priority setting, um, so the Norwegian priority setting for the vaccination and looking to what's going on in the UK. Because, I mean, yes, in Norway too, we have health inequality. Uh, we know that there will be a social gradient in the, in the corona deaths and, and illness. However, Norway has a small population, uh, under 5 million. Uh, our corona, the number of corona deaths are still very low. It's about 600. It was below that in the autumn. And so we know that socioeconomic disadvantage plays a role, but the numbers will not reach statistical significance in our data. So, so when we, we want to, you know, we want to reach, you know, who should we vaccinate to meet the goal of reduce, reduce death? You know, how, so the question is, how many lives can you save by, by vaccinating this group or that group? Then the data isn't there to give priority to socioeconomically disadvantaged groups in, in Norway. Whereas, of course, in the UK, it's a very different story and a very steep social gradient. I think another difference, I mean, this is just my guess, is that the level of deprivation in the UK is just so much greater um, and you have so much so much worse levels of poverty here that that risk factor is also you know by itself a, a, a bigger risk factor in norway but yes we have poverty but it's not as bad so it won't be playing as a big role i think um so so yeah but i mean for me personally as i mean this is something i care greatly about it's in a way the opportunity to give um to give priority in the vaccination queue to people with socioeconomically uh, socioeconomic disadvantage, but were there other ways, and I think it's something we haven't still resolved, are there other ways in which, you know, priority could be given in terms of thinking about how could, you know, economic harms, for example, be reduced for, for this group? Um, so yeah, that's that's what I'm going to say about, about that, and I think we have to, uh, to, to end it there. That's fantastic, Gree and Alina, that was really, really helpful, um, and a very nice discussion. So I'm going to let the two of you go because <laughs> I know you have other commitments, meetings, teaching, etc. So uh, for now, our enormous thanks for you giving up time for the first half of our webinar. Much appreciated. And I'm going to turn over to Emma, who will be chairing the next uh, two contributions. Thank you. And thanks, Thank you me. very much. And Bri, if you could stop sharing your slides. That yes, would be sorry, I just good. realized that I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thanks well. so much. Okay, so we said it was a seminar in two halves, now we move on to, on to the second half. So our next speaker, very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Professor Richard Ashcroft, who is the Deputy Dean of City Law School and an expert in public health ethics and research ethics, and the list goes on and on. Um, but welcome, Richard. Go ahead. Um, well, thank you very much, Emma, uh, and thank you both. Uh, for the kind invitation to participate in this. Uh, I tell people nowadays that I'm a humble administrator. Uh, I, used to, I used to be a respectable academic, and now I just try to enable other people to do their best work. Um, early on in the pandemic, I was approached by the editors of a journal that I'm on the board of because they were doing a feature of, of short essay pieces on what people were reading during the pandemic. Now, if you cast your minds back to March, April last year, one thing that I think many of us experienced was that we had more time than we really knew what to do with. Um, and a lot of people took on uh, projects of various kinds, not necessarily research projects or projects of redesigning their courses, but personal projects. Um, and 
projects of, of self-improvement. You know, I have all this time, which I'm not using on commuting. <clears throat> and uh, I'm dealing with the, the uncertainty and anxiety of the pandemic by trying to, to learn something that I didn't know about. And so the editors of the journal thought it would be an interesting feature to have uh, people saying, well, what are you reading at the moment? Now, I, I approach this in a characteristically peculiar way um, by talking about what I wasn't reading. Because what I found was that in the early days of the pandemic, I was starting lots of reading projects and they would stop after about five or six pages. Now, why? Well, one reason why I think is the psychological burden of adapting to the to the pandemic. And I, like a lot of people, I had disturbed sleep, strange dreams and so on. Um, but I think there was also something more fundamental going on, which was beginning to try to articulate a sense of what expertise, if any, I might have to helping with the current pandemic and an increasing sense of doubt. So the question I'm going to put to you today is what is ethics for? Uh, and I mean no disrespect to, our, to my preceding colleagues and I feel slightly uncomfortable talking about it now they've gone, but one of the things that ethics is for is about giving people a sense that they have a framework for tackling the situation they're in. And if they work through it assiduously enough, uh, they will get the right answer. But my intuition, and certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, and to some extent even now, is that that would be a false reassurance. We do not have a method of producing ethical truth in this kind of situation. Um, and neither are our professions and institutions set up in a way that they could benefit from that kind of deliberation procedure anyway. And I'll illustrate that with my experience of, of giving ethical advice um, in, the, in the last few months. And I've, I've been asked on a couple of occasions. One was I was approached by the Director of Intensive Care Services at a major London teaching hospital who wanted advice on um, principles of fair allocation of resources. And I thought, okay, right, there's got to be a literature on this. There's, there's going to be quite an extensive literature on this. And the answer is, yes, there is an extensive literature on it, but most of it isn't very conclusive. And it certainly doesn't help you make those decisions in a hurry in a novel situation. So a lot of things that people normally do with qualities and so on didn't seem to help very much, not least because we didn't have very good data. We didn't know where we were going with the pandemic. We didn't know much about infection rates and so on and so on and so on. So the machine that would help you decide whether or not to buy, buy cancer drugs, say, wasn't well set up for making decisions about um, uh, allocation of uh, um, ventilation units to, to patients with extreme stress of uh, COVID infection. But on further discussion, it became clear that that wasn't the resource allocation question he was concerned with. The resource allocation question he was concerned with was the resource of his staff. How could he manage his staff in such a way that he would protect them from burnout or the sense of futility or being overwhelmed? How could he best deploy those staff across all the other services that his hospital was meant to, to deliver, not only COVID? And that kind of question about how, how best to allocate what in my new life I'm forced to call human resources, just doesn't seem to be touched on in the le in literature at all. There is, there is an interesting literature on moral harm, uh, moral injury. Um, a lot of that comes from the nursing ethics literature rather than the medical ethics literature. And, and I apologize uh, that I don't know the nursing ethics literature anything like as well as I would like, but it, it certainly seemed to be a question about doing justice to staff in a way that would enable the health service to continue to operate under this extreme stress, a situation which potentially there were many more patients than you could possibly treat, not just 
you know, the standard um, kidney, kidney dialysis example, we might have four or five, but maybe 10, 20, 100 people more than you could possibly treat. How do you, how do you as a healthcare professional manage that? And how does he as a, as a, a manager of NHS staff manage to protect the sense of dignity and self-worth of, of his staff under these very difficult conditions? For what it's worth, I have similar problems in my job, looking after the well-being of my staff under very difficult conditions, and I'm none the wiser. The best I can do is to acknowledge it and to try to hold that emotion and think about it and think about what it, what it means for them, what it means for me, what it means for the credibility of the organisation I work in. The second experience I had uh, was I was asked to join the ethics committee of a London primary care trust, which is an organisation that, that organises primary care services in through general practice and some hospital services, but main, mainly primary care services. And in that, I thought, oh, OK, here we are. Um, I'm being brought onto an ethics committee, which is a form of organisation I recognise. I've sat on before. I know how they run. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to say something useful in meetings. Now, without saying that I didn't say useful things in meetings, and it wasn't really a work worthwhile enterprise, because it was, um, nevertheless, um, there was a very strong sense of we have an institutional structure which is designed to make these decisions. Now, Elena mentioned German bureaucracy. I love bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is the best thing. Everyone should read Max Weber at bedtime and go to bed happy. But, but um, a bureaucracy which is designed for ordinary conditions is not necessarily well easily adapted to extraordinary conditions. But it's in extraordinary conditions you need it more because you need to be able to rely that there is a process and it's going to work. Now, the problem from the point of view of ethics in this is that bureaucracies do ethics by having procedures, not by reflection, deliberation, analysis and argument. So much of the time I would find I would be asked, Oh, yes. And what does the ethicist think after they'd already worked through the process and reached some points of view about how these different policies interacted with each other and, you know, roughly speaking, where the resources were going to go. So the ethics became almost an afterthought of does that sound all right to you? And it did sound all right to me. But what do I know about running the National Health Service? I know nothing about running the National Health Service. And so it seemed to be that ethics was was figured as a kind of. Um, accounting procedure almost that roughly the right questions had been asked in the right order but without any sense of the right answer having been reached because there were there wasn't any space for for difference there wasn't any space for saying well okay well what if we did it this way would that make any difference so i began to think really quite seriously about what ethics was for in these conditions? And the answer, it seems to me, is that ethics as we normally do it isn't actually very helpful. So returning to my piece, I wrote about what I wasn't reading. And one of the things I wasn't reading was Wittgenstein. I, you know, in my youth, I read Wittgenstein all the time because I was that sort of youth. But um, one of the things that we learn from Wittgenstein is that much of the time our phil philosophical puzzles are being bewitched by language. Uh, and some of the time, if we just think clearly enough about what ordinary language does and does well and doesn't do well, we can free ourselves from quite a lot of philosophical puzzles and paradoxes and just come to see things more clearly. Now, if ethics were actually more focused on that sort of thing, about how to live with uncertainty, how to frame questions more clearly so that their, their, their answers are more perspicuous, um, that might be useful. But there's something about the way we're called upon to do ethics that prevents us from doing that, prevents us from deliberating and being curious and holding what Keats called negative capability and being content with the thought. We don't know, actually. And we do our best by just trying to reflect and hold on to uncomfortable emotions and allow others the time and space to say, this is really hard, actually. 
And there isn't a machine for answering these questions. And we just do our best day by day. So it seems to me that if we have, if we're going to maintain a space for ethics, there is always room for principles, heaven knows. There is always room for a utilitarian reckonings and calculations, but there is has also to be space for doubt, uncertainty, um, recognition that we may not be framing the questions in the right way, and uh, uh, an acceptance of human fragility not just in the fragility of the patient, but also the fragility of the decision maker. So that's where I'll leave my thoughts with you. Fantastic. That's given us lots to think about. Thank you very much, Richard. And we're going to move straight on now to the second presentation, then we'll come back to questions relating to, to both after we've, we've heard, heard a bit from Dave. So our next presentation is a double act um, from um, Dr. Charlotte Ells and Professor Jonathan Herring, and they're going to talk about guiding ethical and legal principles with respect to some lovely research that they've done on the ethical framework for adult social care in the pandemic. So massive welcome to you both. Please go ahead. Thank you very much and thank you very much for in, uh, inviting us. I'm going to go first and then uh, hand over to Charlotte. Um, so, as Emma said, we're talking about the, uh, the document the government produced, the ethical framework for adult social care, um, although many of our comments could be used more broadly for, for ethical uh, uh, documents of this kind. Um, so what it was, was a document that was produced by the government for people making policy decisions at a national or local level dealing with social care for adults, uh, and particularly around rationing. Um, the first thing that struck us uh, was um, some points very similar to the ones Richard has made, that it was actually very unclear what the document was designed to do or what the ethical principles were designed to do. Um, so for example, were they designed to uh, enable people to make the right decision um, or were they more about process that people should take into account certain factors? Um, the line between what counts as an ethical decision and what counts as a rational decision uh, was interestingly blurred. Um, there was a point in the document where it was said, as well as ethical factors, decision makers should take into account individual well-being and the public good, as if those weren't ethical factors uh, themselves. So, so what counts as an ethical factor and what counts as uh, common sense, if you like? Uh, was not clearly drawn. Uh, the document lists eight principles uh, that it suggests could be used. Respect, reasonableness, minimizing harm, inclusiveness, accountability, flexibility, proportionality, and community. Um, and I won't go through uh, uh, in, in, in detail how the document understands uh, each of those, a fairly sort of common sense uh, definition was used. Um, it adopts principalism, the idea there are these principles that you should follow, um, but as so often with principalism, uh, the difficulty is uh, there's no hierarchy that's provided, uh, and therefore uh, there's really uh, not much to go on when the principles clash, uh, and you might think this is the kind of document you're only likely to turn to if you've got a difficult case uh, inevitably where these principles are clashing, and then there's really not much there for you uh, to use to decide how to make the right decision. Um, nevertheless, Charlotte and I and our, our analysis suggests it does seem that autonomy is the most important principle. Um, although it's not made explicit, for example, when looking at respect, they see respect being about respecting people's views and choices, making sure people are informed. Um, so it seems in most of the principles, in fact, uh, autonomy uh, is uh, an underlying value. Um, and we're somewhat critical of that. Um, first of all, it doesn't seem that autonomy is a particularly helpful principle uh, in the time of COVID. Uh, people are uh, not well informed and most people just, uh, even the experts are, uh, are not sure uh, about exactly what the, uh, the future will bring uh, and how to make decisions. 
um, in the area of adult social care, autonomy seems a strange principle to rely on given that quite a number of those receiving adult social care will lack the capacity to make decisions uh, about their care. But also, particularly in this time of COVID, we've seen that our health and our well-being is closely interconnected. Uh, and therefore, the idea that my, my decision as to how I want to live my life should be prioritised seems a strange one when our health and our autonomies are now so mixed up together. The document presents autonomy uh, as a principle to weigh up against the public good. And one of our concerns with that is it seems to narrow down the interests that may be taken into account. You have individuals and you have the common good, but there's no valuing there of relationships, of cultural groups, uh, of communities, uh, that their value, uh, unless it can be fitted into either good for individuals or good for the greater good, uh, are, are lost out. The autonomy approach also tends to see this is a case where you've got an individual who would want a particular kind of uh, social care and that must be weighed up against the greater good. Um, and so we might say to someone, no, you can't have the care that you want because of the greater good. But we don't find that a very helpful way of uh, restricting resources uh, in this area. We think it'd be much more helpful to use the idea of communal obligations to each other. Uh, care as a communal resource that we need to allocate between ourselves. Uh, that uh, an approach emphasizing our, our mutual uh, obligations and relationship, relational responsibilities to each other. So if someone is denied care, it's more that we're allocating between our common good between us rather than one person being pitted against the individual. And similarly, that approach would mean that rather than just considering the effect of the decision on the individual, we're also looking at the relationships they're living in and the wider good. Um, I'm going to pass over to Charlotte at this point to talk about the law and ethical principles. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so the second part of our paper really considered, well, what, what does the publication of this um, ethical framework tell us about the relationship um, between law and ethics as it's sort of manifested um, by the publication of that document? So th this is a question that's sort of um, regularly asked in the context of medical law and ethics, and we understand that um, empirically, as, as a matter of fact, the, the, the disputes about whether law or ethics takes primacy and normatively, there can be a question about, well, which ought to take primacy, law or ethics? Well, the way um, that the Coronavirus Act works and the, 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 the kind of gap that this ethical guidance is trying to fill demonstrates, well, in this instance, there's been a suspension of legal obligations. There were legal obligations to um, assess and identify and meet adult social care needs under the Care Act 2014. But what the Coronavirus Act does is give local authorities the option to, to suspend those obligations. And where it does is where this piece of ethical um, guidance comes into play. It's that that professionals trying to decide on those difficult rationing decisions ought to have recourse to. And if we think that the, this sort of um, relationship between law and ethics is problematic in the medical law context, which we often say it is, because essentially it's a game of past the past or hot potato, where law is, is kind of uh, ceding authority to ethics to divine the right answer or the course of conduct that anyone should take and ethics then ends up passing the parcel back and we have no solution. If we think that's problematic in, in the medical law context, which ultimately is, it's even more acute in the adult social care context. And we say that because actually if you look at the ethical framework, you can't divine, as Jonathan said, an answer about what you ought to do in these difficult rationing situations because there is no guidance on how to resolve the clash of principles and, and, and likely nor could there be. But what the document ends up doing is uh, directing those who are faced with these difficult decisions to the professional standards and, and regulations of their profession. So if they're social workers, um, then it's, it's directing them to those documents. And actually there's a big difference between the professional regulatory documents that professionals might have recourse to in the adult social context as compared to the medical context. In as much as actually, if you look at the available guidance from the GMC, um, 
first of all, there's lots of it. And secondly, it can be quite prescriptive uh, in terms of what it recommends to professionals. And you have these toolkits or decision trees, okay, that you can actually work through in order to determine what it is that you ought to be doing on the basis of the ethical principles that the guidance is talking about. If you look at the adult social care context, what you will see is, is something quite different. A, the, the volume of, of this guidance is just far lesser. But secondly, it's, it's not at all prescriptive. It, it might even be sort of more bland and, and barer than the ethical um, framework itself is, or the ethical guidance itself is. It'll be sort of bare declarations about you ought to respect your client's confidentiality. And so what we really wanted to say, well, is if the, if the relationship between law and ethics and its failure or the failure of one or the other to take account of um, or take responsibility for providing action guiding force is problematic in the medical law context, well, it needs further scrutiny and attention and is, is a greater cause for concern in the adult social care context in as much as if we think that individual decisions are essentially going to be a matter of a recourse to individual moral conscience on behalf of decision makers in the medical law context, that is even more so the case in the, in the adult social care context, uh, therefore leaving individual decision makers more vulnerable um, about the sort of quality of their decision making, but also uh, leaves uh, more vulnerable the recipients of the care and, and those who are subject to the decisions that are being made. So that was the sort of second part of our paper that thought about, well, how, what does the publication of this guidance by the government tell us about the relationship between law and ethics in the adult social care context, and particularly uh, in the context of adult social care during the pandemic? Well, that was fabulous. Thank you very much. Two really excellent uh, talks in that session on some of the limitations of ethics and ethical frameworks, which is also given us um, an awful lot to think about. Um, Dave, shall we turn now to your roundup and then come to questions at the end in case there are any questions about what you have to say as well? No, I think I can make some uh, brief comments and I was going to try and um, pull together what has been said by Jonathan, Charlotte and Richard to what was said earlier by Elena uh, and Gree. Um, it strikes me one of, the, one of the interesting themes that's emerged over the course of the six webinars is the distinctive nature of the UK's approach to uh, the role of ethics in public policy making. Um, and it's very clear if you look at an example like Germany, where uh, the Deutsche Ethik Rat has played a very prominent role and has been requested to play a prominent role by the federal government. So it has produced ethically well-informed guidance for a government. And on the whole, it's been followed. Ditto for Norway, similar examples in France. In the UK, that's not been the case. And what strikes me as uh, very interesting is the complete absence of serious ethical discussion by the government of the policy it's adopted. Um, as far as I know, the first time that the Prime Minister mentioned ethics was actually over vaccine passports, when he was asked what he thought about the possibility of vaccine passports, and he immediately made the comment to the effect that this is the kind of stuff we're not used to, by the way that's his phrase not mine, and that we need to consult, he said, a variety of experts because this raises enormously difficult ethical, moral and philosophical questions. And that was the first time, not about prioritization of medical resources, not about prioritization of vaccination, but vaccine passports seemed to strike a particular chord in the British consciousness of something that needed justification or thinking about. So that's first thing I, I thought is very interesting. Secondly, there is a problem in the UK, which has been noted by a number of people. And one of our first questions on the chat room about this is, we don't have national ethics guidance in the UK in the way that you do in Germany, France, Norway, and elsewhere. We have a plethora of advisory and regulatory bodies that uh, offer advice. And that was very early on noted when doctors actually complained very vocally and publicly about unclarity about what they should be doing, given they were getting advice from uh, NICE, MIAG, BMA, Royal Colleges, and people interfering like the Nuffield. Um, and it's an interesting question, do we need clear, consistent, national ethical guidance and how would we provide that? We then come to the problem of, well, is what is done by ethicists, moral philosophers, academics and others, how on earth does that relate interestingly to policy? Um, and then there are standard problems. I mean, I've come to Richard's deep lying skepticism in due course. But one issue that's been raised throughout our contributions is, you can have these very general principles or values, and it's very Germanic to point out the difference between the two, um, but 
everyone can agree that equity is a good thing, freedom is a good thing, solidarity is a good thing. If you ask hard questions about, well, actually, what is the precise balance between all those values? How would they, as a set of values, yield you determinate, clear recommendations as to what we do in any particular case? That really is an impossibly hard question. But I noted that the Germans and Norwegians had a pretty good stab at spelling out how you would move from general principles to clear recommendations. Um, before I come to Richard, the other thing I want to say is, I'm sorry, I have to quote it. I do it all the time. It's an Nora O'Neill's favorite remark, and I borrow it from her. You should all know Groucho Marx's famous apocryphal comment, these are my principles, and if you don't like them, well, I have others. Now, for Nora and for myself, that's a great reductio of an appeal to values, because where do they come from? What's their provenance? What's their legitimacy? Because I can come up with another set of principles and give you an entirely different set of ethical recommendations. So that seems to be a worry. And it's a worry because most people will agree generally with the sort of principles, but if you push them in the way the philosopher might do, and obviously Gree wanted to push people and say, well, where do they come from? What's their weight, etc." cetera. Um, Richard seems to me an important question about, well, look, um, there's something that ethicists do, but then there's something out there that they want to influence that really isn't particularly interested in what we do as ethicists. And anyway, how can we best help them? And it strikes me um, uh, in the literature on ethical expertise, there's a nice distinction made between didacticism and coaching. That is, you can think of the ethicist as the person who says, right, here's what you all do. And I'll tell you how you should do it and why you should do it. And then there's a sort of coaching role where you say, what is it you're worried about? Why are you puzzled about this? Do you think it's an ethical issue? Why do you think it's an ethical issue? How much you start to think about it? And just to link back to something Gree said, and we wasn't picked up, the difference between top down and bottom up ethical reasoning seems really interesting here because the appeal to values, principles from, uh, from a, a national idea, top down in two senses. One, they come from the central body. Two, they're imposed on those who are subject to them. But the other way to do ethics is obviously a kind of bottom up reasoning. So. Um, that's all I really wanted to say by way of round up, because I don't think we're getting any clearer what it is we do. A, I don't think we do ethics in a particularly good way in the public sphere in the UK and haven't over the pandemic. Two, even if we could get closer to the German and Norwegian model, I'm not exactly clear what we would do, given there's an awful lot of people in the UK doing ethics in a way that can be more confusing than helpful. Um, but I wonder if we can take up some, ask some of the questions that have come up um, well, can I ask you about uh, this question that's been pressed? Have we got a problem in the UK of just too much ethical guidance from too many different sources? And has that made it really difficult uh, to make clear recommendations? Like that. Richard. Um, you can never have too much ethical deliberation and guidance. I mean, so it's part of the conversation that we're trying to have, I think. Um, my concern would be a slightly different one, that we have a lot of ethical guidance that speaks with one voice um, with with a couple of rather obvious exceptions in, in reproductive um, and end of life care. The, 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 the general view of most ethicists is broadly similar. And if you ask an ethicist, you will get a broadly similar kind of answer. Um, so that's that's an issue. The other the other thing is that um, it, where is this ethics advice being being generated, where is it being done? So there was, there was, is an ethicist on Sage, which sounds good, and then you realise that there are hundreds of people on Sage. <laughs> so how much influence that person or people have is, is, is a question, and when they joined the deliberations. If you look at the early days of the, we we were all looking back to the pandemic preparedness exercise of uh, 2001 or so, and there was rather good ethical guidance prepared at the time which people gradually rediscovered, but it has some of the same limitations that we've spoken of here. So there's this 20, 20 year period in which we had this document to work through, but we didn't work through it. Yeah, I, I think one, one of the problems is that particularly when it's a sort of an individual decision about uh, a particular person, um, there's a bit of a clash because on the one hand, um, we don't want to be just treated as a group. So somebody would say, I'm an 80 year old, but I don't want to be treated like other 80 year olds. Don't box me in in that way. But on the other hand, uh, we don't want there to be postcode lottery in inverted commas with just sort of uh, random decisions being made. 
Um, and yet that's a real clash between the extent to which we can personalize decisions and, and then the, the extent to which we can produce frameworks which are consistently applied. Charlotte, do you want to add anything? I, th I think I'd agree with um, I mean, everything Jonathan said. I, I guess um, part of my concern about the adult social care context specifically is there isn't actually a, a raft of, of relevant ethical guidance for those sort of um, rationing or care prioritization decisions at all. So whilst it might be true and something we're all familiar with in the medical law context, it's actually sort of doesn't obtain in that very closely allied context. I, I take it that there's no dispute that the policy and measures that have been adopted for over a year now by the UK government are properly subject to ethical review and consideration and are in need of justification in terms of um, infringements of liberty, fairness, reciprocity, and so on. But the question is, how, would, how, was, how why have we failed to create a space in which those matters have arisen? And I did ask at the appropriate webinar, David King, very rhetorically, whether he'd ever see an occasion where there would be an ethicist standing at the one of the lecterns in the regular daily uh, Danny Street briefings in which just as Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty would ask her questions about science and medicine, our ethicists would answer any queries about the uh, moral appropriateness of doing certain kinds of things. But the absurdity of that seems to me to expose part of the problem we have here of, of, of actually engaging ethics with, with public policy in a serious way. So um, any, any solutions would be welcome. Because clearly the Germans are doing it, uh, as are the French. Um, but by the same token, you don't have the government legal service turning up at briefings, yeah, yeah. and you don't have um, um, other types of normative experts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emma, do you want to ask any questions at this point? No, I don't think I do. Thank you. No, I think um, I think we've covered um, a, a great deal of the issues. I'll just have a last look at the at the Q and A to see if anything else has come. I've through. been looking there. We've covered most of the issues. But it's been really fabulous um, and far ranging today. Um, so thank you so much to, to everybody who has, who has spoken and to all the attendees. Some of you have been to a number of our, of our webinars. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to put recordings of all the webinars on the website. It's taking a little while because uh, partly they have to be edited by Great Ormond Street, who does a really fine job of making them look really lovely. And partly because Durham is going through a process of redoing all its websites, which is just slightly hideous and taking us a, an awful long time. But um, rest assured, they will be up there as, as soon as we can. Um, and then there'll be a resource for, for people to access into the future. So Emma, if, if we don't have any more questions, and I, I just checked the chat room and it seems to be we're going over some of the same ground as, as before. Um, it might be appropriate for us both to um, say that many of the themes that have come up in this and preceding webinars will be addressed in the final conference in July. And um, we hope that uh, all those who've taken part in the webinars will be able to play some kind of role in that final conference. Um, and our renewed thanks to everybody across all six webinars who've helped us to think through all these issues. But I think it would be appropriate now to conclude by offering some thanks beyond speakers. Um, personally, I'd like to thank my co-investigator Emma for all her <laughs> all her work and and uh, provocations and thoughts and 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 criticism. I'd like in absentia to thank Mariana Dittborn, who's been our administrator and who had um, the ridiculous uh, decision to have a child, which meant she was taken off on maternity duty. And by the way, has to be reminded not to come to these webinars that she has other things to do. But will be back with us for July. So my enormous thanks to her, and I think. Finally, some enormous thanks to Olivia Wheeler, um, who has been both silent and not present visually, but who is the uh, postgraduate medical education officer for Great Ormond Street and has done an absolutely fabulous job in helping us to advertise and arrange and get permissions from all the speakers. And our immense gratitude to her and to the, the background, background people at uh, Great Ormond Street. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, yes. And I think uh, a certain measure of <laughs> when you start on a, off on a research project, you never know how it will work and you don't know what speakers will be like and you worry about everything. It has been absolutely fabulous. Every webinar has been brilliant in terms of what we've been able to explore. So 
Uh, it's worked fabulously well and has renewed my faith in, in the point of applying for research funding, which sometimes <laughs> gets put into, into serious doubt. But in this occasion, a beautifully formed small research um, a grant from the British Academy has been absolutely fabulous and, and well worth the money. So with that, I don't know if you want to add anything, Emma. No, just that we're going to, the, the, the conference will go ahead and Ron and Gillen is asking what next. Um, and, and we'll also be thinking about possible publications to come out of this as well. Yeah. Um, that's it, thank you very much. So for now, um, uh, could I just say, as I have done for every webinar's conclusion, I do hope everybody's healthy and well. Please stay safe, and if you can, stay sane as well, because these are incredibly difficult times, and we wake up with different uh, predictions of when it'll all end and what will we be doing in, at the end of the year. So uh, stay sane and healthy and keep thinking about the problems. Um, so for now, goodbye to everyone, and thank you. Thanks.